Okay, hello, everybody. So um, <clears throat> next uh, 10, 12 minutes or so, we'll go through a little bit about um, PCT, uh, a contract development and manufacturing organization in the space. I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, what we think is our value proposition uh, to, the, to the industry. And uh, we like to look at this as at the moment there's light at the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of cell commercialization. And uh, we'll maybe try to explain why. About um, 15 years or so ago, a number of us who were um, in the business for some time, probably in the cell therapy business, we weren't really calling it cell therapy at the time, but um, we've been in it for about 10 or 12 years before that, recognized the need for GMP, GLP manufacturing capacity to be available for GTP cell and tissue processing capacity and for the ability to move these cells around. So we started PCT in order to help companies that were looking to develop products in the cell therapy, in the, in the burgeoning cell therapy industry, um, and put together some expertise around that. Um, we felt after some time after doing that work that we needed to support the entire clinical development program because what we saw coming were a number of clients that were pretty early on, had scientific ideas, very good scientists, and they were trying to achieve that very elusive bench-to-bedside uh, uh, bridging of the gap. And so they, you know, they would come to us and say, how do we get this product from here to there? And most people didn't have any processes. So we had to um, beef up a little bit. And the first thing that we, we did was expand our capacity. And we did that through a relationship that we had with Dendrion at the time that was, we were manufacturing for Dendrion in our East Coast facility. So around 2002, we expanded our capacity to the West Coast as we entered into a business relationship where we acquired the asset on the West Coast from Dendrion, which was then about seven or 8,000 square feet of active space, uh, about 15,000 square feet of space that was, or maybe 18,000 square feet that was not being, uh, being used. That's our Mountain View facility. We then added in both of the facilities a fair amount of uh, product process and assay development expertise. And this was in recognition at the time that what the industry needed, if it was going to be successful, was to be able to take these science experiments essentially and turn them into products. And I think we all thought we were thinking at that time, we thought we'd be able to get these products from that point into patients and get them paid for, et cetera. But a lot of that was left for tomorrow. And really, the industry was more or less thinking about GMP capacity. That's where the thoughts had gone, especially since we had put this capacity up and it seemed to be able to push product around, particularly, again, with our relationship with Dendrion. Having added this product process and as a development expertise, we started to take some of the lessons that we had learned and apply them to our clients' uh, our clients' work. And that heavy science and heavy technology uh, emphasis brought with it some regulatory expertise and some regulatory people so that we were starting to become an attractive um, partner as people were developing their therapies. We moved then into some cell and tissue sourcing and banking, realized this was just a natural extension as a bolt-on of our current uh, business model. And as I mentioned, we started doing some fair amount of um, consulting. In the, in the beginning, it's interesting, we weren't really focusing on the consulting because what we really wanted was people to just throw their stuff over the fence and say, let's work together. But uh, we actually found that there were a number of consultants beginning to pop up in the industry. So we said, we may as well do that. We'll do good work in consulting and then uh, forward bring that in. So it was almost a, it was almost a forward integrating business part of, of the business model. So having done that, um, we ended up with what we consider to be industry-leading track record. And there's a lot of big numbers here that we can go through. Um, there's you know, tens of thousands of products that we've processed. We do a fair amount of patient-specific processing in addition to large cell uh, banking. But the majority of what we do is in the patient-specific product um, uh, area. We've um, published many papers in the area, anywhere from the technical side, the development side, all the way through the regulatory side and, uh, and, and uh, on business models as well. We have shipped product all over the country, some product into other countries, but predominantly these 14, 15,000 uh, shipments that we performed are within the United States. We've got a number of products stored um, in our freezers, and the freezer rooms are growing as we expand the capacity. We've been uh, doing regulatory filings in US and Europe. But the number that really means something to us is the fact that over 6,000 patients have received the products that we've manufactured out of these facilities. And why that's important to us is that's given us a lens into what these products need to look like 
in order for them to get not just to the lip of the bed where they fall off, but actually into the patient. And I use that as a metaphor, really, for what's happening in the industry today, is that as products are getting approved, they're almost there, but they're struggling at the commercialization phase. So having been in the position that we're in, multiple clients seeing the pain, feeling it with our clients, we're now moving this story forward. And the first thing we realized, I think, out of all of this was that we, while we envision ourselves to be a manufacturing and development and consulting and regulatory organization in regenerative medicine, we really are a client service organization and have focused our, our offerings on service, quality, and value. And that value proposition has been very important to us. So we've got a very strong project management um, sector that's now moved in. We have four project managers and that number um, is growing and each of those has too many projects at the moment. So we're, we're building that uh, group. And again, through this exercise of having approached many of you in this room and others, um, when we give the price, people always look at us and say, oh my God, that's really expensive. And we know that's expensive. But we know that it's not more expensive than it absolutely has to be today. And it's not a function of what we're trying to do. It's a function of what this industry is right now. Because it really, at the end of the day, we're asking the question, how do we get the cost of goods down so that we don't have this shock and so that we can get these products uh, reimbursed? We're putting commercial systems into our facilities. We have largely, as I mentioned, came out of a clinical operation doing phase one, two, three, three B trials. It's quite a bit of activity and now we're moving in with commercial systems implementation. We have commercialization strategy and value engineering going on left and right with our clients and for some own product lines that we're working on for the Neostem, which is our parent company. And we are moving into Europe at some point in the, in the foreseeable future. So we have a number of conversations ongoing right now, but we're looking at commercial capacity in Europe as well. And all of this reflects what we've seen from the beginning. I mentioned that we're taking science and turning them into products, and the next transition has been this concept of taking these products and really making therapeutics out of them. Um, because the problem, really, if we look at the end and say, what problem are we trying to solve? We're trying to solve the problems of deliverability. Can we get these patients to get these products uh, to patients so that they can use them as they use no, you know, sort of ordinary drugs or uh, biologics? Cost of goods is a barrier to entry in this field. And I mentioned to you the sticker shock before, which is one component of that that we've got to fix. But the other is just really about reimbursability of the products. Can we get these products paid for? And can they really become therapeutics? The robustness of the process is really an important consideration. You know, so products that rely so heavily on process to the point where people actually mistake the process for the product very often in the industry. Can humans really cut it? And I think the answer is absolutely not. We're building beautiful facilities. We're operate, we're, we're cleaning the facilities. We're monitoring the facilities. We're doing all kinds of wonderful things. And then we put filthy people and products inside the facilities all wrapped up in gowns. And it, does, it just doesn't make sense. The whole thing needs to be flipped on its end. And we've got to go to the end of this process and look at it and say, what do we need to do to make this work? Because the current the current pathway is just not going to work. Um, in um, Chris Hewitt's words from Loughborough, he talks about scalability in this terms and says it's not just a bigger pot. We can take small bioreactors now and make product, but when you start to expand them, everything changes. So how do you deal with these um, sort of changes? And the general challenges here with developing products in a developing industry, change upon change is always very difficult. And at the same time, we're trying to control um, costs. So what we talked about this morning on the regulatory panel, for those that you were here, there, there are many questions that have been answered, many questions that remain unanswered, but clearly the solutions are beginning to form. And I believe the fact that there are a number of products in commercial production now, and we're watching those products succeed, we're watching them fail, we're watching what the issues are, we now see light at the end of the tunnel, and we know what we need to do to get these to the finish line. So the question we're asking, really, and working on is, how has the approach to cost of goods and delivery changed over the last two or three years? Where is it going? And when promising therapies do proceed into later stage clinical trial and require scale up and scale out, um, you know, what types of processes can we, in, can we use to counter the problems that we're seeing? Um, one of the concepts that came up this morning during the regulatory uh, interaction was uh, you have to develop these products with commercialization in mind. And we continue to ask the question about what does that mean? Does that mean at phase one to go build commercial capacity? I, I don't think so. Does it mean validate 
assays, including the potency assay? We don't think so. The question about when to automate a process, is it too early in phase one? And worse yet, for people who are moving into phase three, is it too late in phase three? Have we not made that proper comparability bridge to drive around that spine of uh, product characterization? So even if the money were available, would you be able to stop? These are very difficult questions uh, to answer. And the way we're answering this now with our clients is really by look, starting at the end. And for the end for us is an adaptation of the concept of a target product profile. It's really beginning to establish a living commercial development plan that changes, that says, okay, we do have milestones that we need to reach. We do need to get various places. Investors want something sooner. We need something to tell media. We just need things before you would in a vacuum. So how do you do that? Well, you look to see what are you putting aside and take that, understand the risk. It's really all about um, managing risks. At the same time, it provides an effective tool for communication between the developer and the regulator. So the agencies understand where you're going, internal stakeholders, so everyone's on the same page and everybody understands the risks that you're taking as a management team um, and between the developer and the solutions providers that are out there. And one of the tremendous things about the industry now is there are many solution providers of all colors. So you have people from the regulatory side, the finance side, the business side, et cetera. It just goes on and on. There's a lot of help out there. Once that happens, a product falls out of that, a therapeutic falls out. And around that, we're establishing a design space and defining the critical quality attributes of that uh, product as it falls out, of that therapeutic. And once that's done, you can pull back one unit at a time, understand the unit operations, and build a process that makes some sense. We have the ability to define what the unit operation is, and one of our defaults is to look at cell selection or cell wash or buffy coat separation as unit operations. It's not necessarily the best way to do it. So it's all part of stepping back, using the experience that we have as a collective industry and building the proper clinical development plan uh, and product development plan that matches. Is it one of the, um, uh, I had asked Liz Smith, who at the time was VP of Regulatory and, and Quality at Dendrion, when the when Dendron first received its approval in the United States, what she would have done differently had she had the chance to go back over it again, and she just said, collect more data. And that would have helped them in many ways that most of us really understand right now. Why more data? And they collected a lot of data going, uh, going through. So data collection has become an important part of the development plan, as well as thinking all the way through this, how do we reduce um, the cost of goods? So the continuum really is about taking sound science and quality risk management and and providing a product that has consistently high quality at reasonable cost of goods that meet the demand over the commercial life of the product. It doesn't mean you're setting something up that's commercially viable right now, but that at the end of the day will be commercially viable and you can see a clear shot from where you are today to where you go. So thank you very much. We have a booth out here. We have a number of represent representatives and we'd love to talk to you if we haven't already. Thank you.